Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the International Soccer Pad Podcast by Canada Soccer Files. I'm Kevin. And I'm Connor. And today we will be discussing Group F, uh, the final group uh, in Euro 2020. That's right. We'll be doing a group by group preview, or we are doing a group uh, by group preview of two of Euro 2020, and uh, with uh, within that a team by team overview. And we're also going to do an overview of players, but uh, we are still considering a deeper uh, dive into uh, examining the players. So, part one, we're going to begin with an overview of the group. Uh, this will take a look at the rankings, the odds, the head-to-head -head records, and a comparison of the size of each country. Okay, and then part two, we launch into the uh, main part of the podcast, which is a team-by-team -team overview. Uh, we're going to look at their long history, their recent history, their qualifying record for this cup, and uh, a brief overview of their players. And finally, in part three, we'll have a discussion of each team's prospects, and we'll discuss our predictions for this group. All right. Uh, I see you're wearing a, a red shirt there. Is it what I hope it is? Yes, this is my South Korea jersey. Um, I've, I've finally decided to wear a non-European team and be neutral. Uh, so Korea was the best I had for that. Okay, well, I was looking for my uh, Honduras shirt, but I think I, I packed it away somewhere, uh, and so I can't be so neutral. But I have already admitted to a bit of a bias for Wales, and today I'm wearing a Cardiff tee, a Cardiff uh, jumper. Very nice. <laughs> okay, uh, let's begin with part one, uh, an overview uh, of the teams. Let's just do a quick introduction of Group F. Connor? Sure. So Group F uh, contains Germany, France, Portugal, and Hungary. Uh, Germany are three times winners of the Euros and have reached the semi-finals in each of the last three editions of this tournament. Okay, Portugal are the defending champions. They won the Euro 2016, which was their first ever major trophy. Uh, the team Portugal beat in that 2016 final was host nations France. Um, France, of course, uh, come in as the defending World Cup champions. All right, and Hungary are a former powerhouse soccer nation, at one time stronger than all of these teams. Uh, we'll have more to say about that later. Uh, Hungary are appearing for their second straight Euro Cup, having reached the expanded tournament in 2016. So that seems like a very strong group, uh, Connor. Aren't the teams supposed to be seeded so that they avoid each other in the group stages? Well, we've talked about it a bit. Uh, on some earlier podcasts, but it's worth mentioning again here. Uh, for major tournaments, teams are sorted into different pots. Each team in the same pot is then drawn into a different group, so teams from the same pot cannot be drawn against each other. The pots are usually based on FIFA World Rankings, so if there are six groups, in theory, the six best teams are in pot one, the next six best teams are in pot two, and so on. However, for this tournament, teams were ranked according to the number of points uh, they achieved in their qualifying group. So that's changed the traditional order of things. Uh, Ukraine ended up in pot one, for example, along with Germany. France had the seventh best qualification record, and so ended up in pot two. And Portugal had the 13th best qualification record and ended up in pot three. So that's how it came to be that three strong teams all ended up together in the same group. Okay, well, uh, poor Hungary. Uh, what do you think of that system, Connor? In a way, I don't mind it um, in that they've based their uh, the rankings um, on the qualification record, which seems like a very merit-based way of, of seeding teams. However, um, it does throw up some, some weird results, or it can, and that seems to be the case here with three very strong teams uh, all, all in the same group together. What do you think of it? Yeah, kind of like you. I like it in, in theory because um, it uh, kind of forces teams to put their best foot, foot forward in qualifying. But, uh, you know, in practice, it ends up being a group like this. I mean, I, I've heard of the uh, 
group of death. They usually nominate one group uh, in every tournament as a group of death, but I've, ne I've never, we need a stronger word than death for this group. <laughs> That's right, poor Hungary. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to the uh, rankings. Um, I'll just move the page down here a little bit. All right. So Germany are 13th in the FIFA rankings and 9th according to ELO. Uh, they were number one in the FIFA rankings and number two in ELO going into the 2018 World Cup. However, after disastrous results in the Cup and elsewhere, uh, they first dropped to 16th and 9th uh, before the end of that year. Uh, that ended a run of 12 years spent inside the top 10 in both ranking systems. Um, and again, they enter this tournament as 13th and 9th, respectively. Okay, well, you know, uh, even when Germany is below 10th spot, uh, you'd always kind of um, view them as a team capable of uh, going to the final. How about France? Uh, France is ranked second, according to FIFA, and third, according to ELO. They are one place behind Belgium in both systems, and so are the highest... Uh, second highest ranked team in the tournament. Uh, France have been very up and down in the rankings, though. Uh, they were number one overall in both systems following their major successes at the turn of the century. Uh, between April 2010 and December 2013, however, they were 10th or lower, reaching a low of 21st in the FIFA rankings and 25th in ELO in July 2010. July 2010, that's, uh, that's shortly after they mutinied in the uh, 2010 World Cup, isn't it? That's right. There was a player revolt against coach Raymond Dominic, um, which certainly had an impact uh, for on-field results as well, um, as they crashed out disgracefully uh, from the tournament in South Africa. Well, one of them's going to have to go here. Uh, maybe it'll be Portugal. Can you tell us about them? Yeah, Portugal are currently fifth in both systems. Um, they are much more consistent than France in the rankings, however. Uh, they've been in the top 10 in the FIFA rankings uh, for almost 12 straight years. Um, and the lowest they reached during that time in ELO was 13th, uh, which was just prior to their Euro Cup win in 2016. Well, going way back in history, I see uh, they were uh, 36th in December 19. 98 we'd maybe have to go back a bit further to see uh, really how how average they were in the previous century which we'll get into today uh speaking of uh, deep in the past how about hungary's ranking so hungary are 40th in fifa and 35th in elo uh this represents a rise from 52nd and 55th at the end of 2019 uh, their best recent ranking was 20th in FIFA in June 2016, uh, but during that time they only reached 42nd in ELO. So given their sharp rise of 20 places in FIFA in just six months, um, the ELO ranking seems to be a better reflection of their general play overall. Um, and again, they were around 40th uh, in ELO at that time. Yeah, this one goes, uh, the FIFA rankings only go back to uh, 1995. Actually, the ELOs go back... Further, but I didn't check. But uh, do you have any guess where they would have been around 1954? 1954, um, they must have been in the top five in the world, um, if not closer to first or second. Yeah, they won. Uh, they 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 went undefeated for six years in a row. Um, by that time, so they were considered the best. Although England disagreed, I have a little story about that. Uh, today, let's take a look at the odds. They're pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, Germany and France are are given basically the same odds to win the group, um, and Portugal are only marginally back. So it it seems like the bookkeepers are are expecting a wide open three horse race. Um, unsurprisingly, Hungary are are quite a ways back of those three teams, and are only given outside odds of winning the group. Um, and these odds, of course, are just for winning the group, not necessarily to advance, which either two or three teams will from this group. Okay, well, when we get to the end, we'll uh, we'll see whether we agree with those odds or uh, whether we have our, our differing opinions. Do you want to take us through the head-to-head -head records? Yeah, um, 
uh, definitely. Uh, Germany has a winning record over France. And um, sorry, I'm just a bit lost in my uh, speech here. A winning record over France and uh, over Portugal. But strangely, they don't have a winning record over Hungary. Um, uh, when it comes to France, they actually lost their last game with France uh, in the 2016 Euro Cup. Uh, uh, but otherwise, they beat them in, in the 2014 uh, World Cup uh, quarterfinal. So, sorry, the 2016 uh, Euro Cup was the semi final. So, recently, they're fairly even. And surprisingly, they haven't played each other in major competition that much, just five games. And uh, Germany has a slight edge. Uh, Germany versus Portugal. Well, Portugal was kind of weak in the last century, so um, they basically had the better of them, um, except for one game in 1986 that Portugal won. But interestingly, since 2006, they've played four times, and uh, Portugal has won them all. That's the third place match in 2006, the quarterfinal in 2008, and uh, the group stage in 2012 and 2014. Portugal have won them all. What do you think, Connor? Yeah, kind of surprising that they've had had the better record there. I'm just looking at your notes. Was it was it Portugal or was it Germany? Um, I may be getting confused here. Oh, I am getting confused. Uh, uh, I was saying Portugal uh, won all of those. Um, yikes, I got to start that part again. It's actually uh, Germany that has won uh, in the competitions. This is in the finals of competitions rather than in qualifying. And uh, yes, they've won the last four, uh, having last met in 2014. Okay, well, I botched that up, but hopefully I'll get this one right. Uh, Germany and Hungary have only met two times and it was both in 1954. I'm going to save that story until later. But basically, uh, each one of them won a game there. Uh, France and Portugal haven't, uh, haven't met often either, just four times. The last time they met was in the 2016 Euro Cup final. And, of course, uh, Portugal won that game in, uh, in extra time. Um, a bit of a good story uh, for that one too. Uh, Portugal versus Hungary, uh, they have met uh, eight times and Portugal has won seven of those times. Uh, they didn't really meet in the past except for the uh, World Cup in 1966 and uh, they tied 3-3 uh, three, three in the last Euro Cup. Uh, so that's kind of interesting coming into this. Uh, uh, Hungary won the group, whereas Portugal finished third. Um, but in 2018 World Cup qualifying, Portugal won both legs. Uh, finally, Hungary have a winning record over France. Uh, they beat them twice in, in 1964 and uh, bested them in 1972. But then in 1978 and 1986, uh, both in World Cup group stages, uh, Hungary lost. They were a bit weaker uh, by that point. Okay, that's uh, the head-to-head -head record. A, a few surprises there. Let's take a look at the countries uh, in terms of size and population. Sure. So Germany uh, are the most populous country uh, located entirely in Europe with, with 84 million people. Um, I say it that way because Germany is is behind uh, population, um, behind Russia and Turkey, um, who have also both qualified for this tournament, but both these countries have parts of their population located in Asia. Uh, France uh, is a larger country than Germany in terms of area, but has a smaller population uh, with 60, 64 million people, uh, so that's some 20 million fewer. Um, in terms of population, France is the next largest country in Europe behind Germany. Moving on to Portugal, Portugal has 10.6 million people. Um, so they're quite a ways behind uh, the top two in this group. Um, but they are considered a medium sized country in Europe uh, on par with others, uh, countries like Sweden and the Czech Republic. 
And then also on that list of medium-sized countries is Hungary, um, who, at 10, who with 10 million people um, are just behind Portugal um, by only about half a million. So all four of these countries are in the top 20 uh, most populous UEFA members. Um, so in summary, Germany have 84 million, France 64, Portugal uh, 10.6, and Hungary 10 million people. So there'll be lots of uh, European fans tuning in uh, to Group F. You bet. Uh, okay, now we move to the main part of the uh, of the uh, podcast. I keep calling it a podcast, but it's also a video cast. But I should say that there's nothing really on the video that we don't cover uh, in speaking. So we're aiming to uh, have it uh, be both a podcast and a video podcast. Uh, we've added nicknames to this uh, team by team section. So, uh, what about uh, Germany? Yeah, um, the nickname kind of used in Germany is uh, the National Elf or the National Eleven. Um, the term I'm more familiar with is a term more familiar or more commonly used outside of Germany, and that's Die Mannschaft, uh, which basically means the team. Um, I didn't realize that wasn't really used in Germany, though. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, well, let's begin the, ho uh, the long history with just a view of their participation uh, in both Cups. So uh, Germany is the second best team in the world behind Brazil. Uh, they have won four World Cups uh, uh, and they've reached the final eight times. Uh, their regional record is not as impressive, but they have won the European uh, Cup three times and been in the final uh, six times. I think uh, they withdrew from the 1930 World Cup. I think they were unwilling to make that long boat trip to um, Uruguay. And they didn't enter the first two Euro Cups either. But other than that, they participated in every cup. Uh, moving on to their long history. Oh, okay, we've got a little bit of a format change here, Connor. Do you want to just uh, talk about that? Yeah, given... Um all four of these teams really have such long, uh, long histories on the international stage. Um, we could really talk for hours um, about their histories. But what we're going to do is uh, just do a kind of a, a brief uh, kind of high level version of the World Cup history. And we'll spend a bit more time talking about their Euro history um, versus trying to fit it all in. That's right. And if we uh, continue doing this podcast, we'll We'll probably go that way, whereas if it's the World Cup, we'll cover that in more detail. Uh, or if it's the regional competition, we'll cover that in more detail. So just a, a quick overview of the World Cup then. Uh, it was a weak start in World Cup play, uh, withdrawing in 1930 and uh, being banned in 1950, which I should have mentioned uh, during uh, their participation. Uh, they were basically blamed for their role in the war. There, so left out of a lot of world sporting competitions. Um, however, this week start was offset with a third place finish in 1934. From then until 2018, though, they not only qualified for all cups, but they went past the group stage every time, the latter a record that not even Brazil uh, can boast. Surprisingly, the only time they hadn't passed the group stage was in 1938, which was at the height of their political power, the Nazis, of course, in power. Uh, had they won in 1994 rather than in 1990, their wins would be like a German clockwork every 20 years. As it is, the mid-90s proved a relatively weak period, uh, reaching only the quarterfinal twice in a row in 1994 and 1998. Outside of those years, they placed in the top three every time from 1982 to 2014. Uh, perhaps bigger than winning the cup in 2014, they thrashed Brazil, who was hosting the cup, uh, by a score of seven to one, which uh, together with Brazil's failure to win since 2002, uh, argued for Germany being the best World Cup team. Uh, that record, the whole thing, puts into perspective the magnitude of and the humiliation at being knocked out of the group stage of the 2018 World Cup. 
Yeah, I'll talk about the 2018 uh, World Cup right away, but that that 7-1 win against Brazil is, is worth a second mention. Um, I watched highlights uh, not long ago, um, and Germany scored four goals in a six-minute period in the first half. It was just incredible to re-watch uh, that event. Uh, I actually arrived late uh, uh, at my brother's place to watch that one. You were there. Uh, and I couldn't believe uh, what I saw when I walked in. It was already three or four nothing. That's just an astonishing game. Mm -hmm. um, less astonishing, though, was Germany's record in the 2018 World Cup. Uh, they went into that tournament as reigning champions and actually breezed through qualification, winning all 10 of their games. Um, however, Germany put up a feeble defense of their uh, title crown. Uh, they lost to Mexico in their opening game, and then we're very fortunate to beat Sweden on a last-minute free uh, free kick, uh, despite being outplayed for large periods of that game. They entered a crucial final match um, against relative minnow South Korea. Uh, despite relentless pressure, uh, Germany could not find a way through, and while pushing hard for a winner, conceded twice in second-half stoppage time to lose 2-0. Uh, Kevin, you're a Korea fan. What was it like for you watching that game? Well, I lived in Korea for uh, 15 years and I was there for the 2002 World Cup. And, uh, you know, uh, that was uh, amazing. This was almost as amazing. Uh, Son Hung Min uh, running up the bare German defense. Uh, it was just, I was in heaven. I don't mind Germany, but uh, to see uh, an underdog like that knock germany out it, it, it was uh it was special in an evil cackly way <laughs> let's take a look at their euro cup history this will be a bit longer and include some of the stories uh uh behind the tournament they started weekly in european competition too and their record is not as stellar as their world cup <clears throat> They didn't enter the first two Euro Cups and didn't qualify on their first entry in 1968. But that's the only time they failed to, to qualify for a cup. They had an excellent spell after that, uh, reaching the final uh, three times and winning it twice. In fact, they were undefeated through the whole period except for that loss in the final in 1976 to Czechoslovakia and even that was on penalties so they were undefeated in regular time uh, we could say uh, they won the final over USSR in 1972 and over Belgium in 1980 1984 was a group stage finish and 1988 was almost as poor reaching only the semi-final as host uh, just to remind you that the tournament was eight teams at this time. So um, once you got past the group stage, you were at the semifinals. Uh, there, despite going undefeated in the group stage and winning it over Italy, they lost to the Netherlands. A second strong period uh, was when they reached the final twice more in a row. Uh, they lost to Denmark in 1992, and after beating a beating out England in penalties in the semi-finals, they beat the Czech Republic to, change, to claim their second title. Uh, that was in 1996. It was uh, two group stage finishes after that, earning only one draw in the group stage of Euro 2000, and arguably worse in 2004 because they tied Latvia, though they also tied the Netherlands. So two ties, but one of them was to Latvia. Uh, but they came back into form in 2008 with a second-place finish, though it was a fairly easy run to the final where they lost to Spain. Uh, Italy present, uh, prevented them from reaching the final in 2012, knocking them out in the semi-finals after Germany had won all games in qualifying and in the group stage. And it was host France. Uh, at the same stage, the semi-final stage in 2016. Uh, looking at uh, their qualifying record in, in Euro, it was Yugoslavia who finished ahead of them in 1986. Uh, again, their only non-qualification. Uh, but it was actually a tie in Albania in the last game that really put them to the sword. 
on the whole, clarify, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I'll just clarify that was 1968. Oh, what did I say? 86. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And uh, no, 1968. Their only non-qualification. Um, on the whole, qualifications have been less impressive than in the World Cup. Uh, they were undefeated in qualifying over the next three campaigns, though, knocking out England in the first of these. But they tied Greece twice in the second and Malta once in the third, uh, which was in 1980. Northern Ireland in 1984 handed them their first uh, qualifying loss since 1968. And they did it again in the second leg. Uh, so they beat Germany home and away. Uh, wow. just, just, yeah. Uh, despite those two losses and also tying Austria, uh, Germany nevertheless qualified over both. This pattern of finishing first but losing once or twice to a weak team persisted. They lost to Wales in 1992, Bulgaria in 1996, where they also tied Wales at home, and Turkey in the first game of the 2000 campaign. And worst of all, a 3 nothing loss to the Czech Republic at home in 2008, where they also tied Cyprus, Ireland, and in their last game at home, Wales again, to actually finish behind the Czech Republic, although uh, both Czech Republic and them qualified directly. They had been undefeated in uh, going back to 2004. They had been undefeated in qualifying for that tournament, uh, which was the first time they were undefeated in a qualification since 1980. But they did tie Lithuania at home and Iceland away. They won all games in 2012, which was their only perfect campaign in Euro Cup qualification compared to five perfect campaigns in World Cup qualification. Uh, 2016 marks the only time they lost two games in the campaign, uh, going down to Poland and Ireland. That inconsistency, though, shouldn't overshadow the fact that they only failed to qualify once in 1968. Yeah, that's an amazing uh, qualification record. Mm -hmm. uh, in recent, in recent uh, tournaments, Germany were knocked out in the semifinals by Italy in 2012. Um, Mario Balotelli, you remember him? I do. Uh, he scored both goals in a 2-1 win, um, and then they lost out to France in the semifinals in 2016. Uh, prior to losing to France, though, uh, Germany avenged their loss to Italy from four years earlier by beating them in an epic penalty shootout in the quarterfinals. Uh, both teams missed three of their first five penalties, um, but Germany won after nine shooters each. Wow. Um, as you mentioned, Germany had a bit more trouble than usual qualifying in 2016. Um, they won their group ahead of Poland by just a point, um, but lost to Poland and Ireland um, on the road and then only managed a, a draw against Ireland as well. Yeah, it looks like Ireland uh, and Britain, uh, the, the smaller teams in Britain, caused them a bit of trouble. Uh, let's just take a quick look in summary then. Uh, uh, in terms of consistency, uh, Germany is a very consistent team, but uh, when they do laps, they tend to do so spectacularly, but uh, we, can, we can always rely on them to recover quickly. Yeah, I agree. Germany are one of the most consistent tournament performers of all time. Um, what happened in 2018, you think, would have to be an, an aberration. Um, and from their point of view, hopefully they can recover as they've done in the past. Um, however, there is a sense that they may not be quite back to their dominant best yet. Um, and recent, uh, recent results support that, which we'll get into, um, which may suggest that another uh, rebuild uh, is in order. Um, overall, I would say there's kind of an unusual number of question marks over Germany uh, heading into a major tournament. Yeah, that doesn't happen too often. We're going to focus a little bit on their recent history here. Uh, the 2014 World Cup was their first major tournament win since 1996. So that ended a dry spell. But uh, they had been a powerhouse even when they were rebuilding. And I remember in 2004, 2006, they were expecting uh, weaker results because they were rebuilding. Uh, but they still finished near the top. 
Uh, they looked uncharacteristically shaky in 2016, despite reaching the semi-final and losing to host France there. But in terms of uh, team building, they should be doing better because in the 2017 Confederation Cup, they sent a B team. Uh, I remember Timo Werner was on it and some of the guys who are coming up now, uh, which was a testament to their depth in talent. And even in the short term then, the uh, 2018 World Cup forces a bit of a re-evaluation and it, it does kind of seem to need some rebuilding. So to be sure, they'll uh, probably return to the top, but uh, continued poor performances through through 2018 and 19 suggest they'll be struggling in the short term, as you said. Yeah, yeah an interesting thing for Germany is um, coach uh, Joachim Louv has been in charge since 2006. Um, so he's taking Germany to a seventh major tournament, but he will be stepping down after this uh, after this European Cup. So the, the job of rebuilding will, will fall to uh, former Bayern Munich manager Hansi Flick. Mm, okay. Well, we'll take a look at the 2020 Euro Cup qualifying. We've said that they're actually uh, a little bit shakier in Euro qualifying than in World Cup qualifying. And it kind of bears out here uh, exactly the pattern we've noticed in over the last 20 years, which is... Uh, losing one game this time not to really a weak team often it's a weak team but this time it was the netherlands otherwise they won uh, all games and finished on top of the group anyway which is uh, what they usually do let's take a look at their recent uh, matches yeah we talked a little bit about um some poor form and that that's especially come in the nations league um, in the 2018-19 Nations League A, they finished uh, third out of three um, behind Netherlands and France, um, though because of a reorganization, we're not relegated. Um, in the 2020-2021 uh, League A, of the Nations League, um, they came behind Spain and ahead of Switzerland and Ukraine. However, they won just two of their six games and were crushed 6 nothing uh, in Spain. Wow. Um, in World Cup 2022 play, um, they won at home to Iceland and away to Romania, um, but then were shocked at home by North Macedonia, who won 2-1 in Germany. Um, what do you make of that? That is, uh, you know, a terrible thing to be coming into this group with. Uh, the, the 2018 World Cup shock uh, at the group stage and this... Uh, and then they face teams like France and Portugal. Uh, I would be nervous. Yeah, the six nothing loss to uh, to Spain that came in just uh, November 2020, so really not that long ago. Um, so, like we said, a few question marks um, over a normally uh, reliable and consistent, uh, yeah, German team. Yeah, let's take a look at their scorers uh, during the um, the uh, Euro Cup. And uh, we see, I'm going to let you pronounce his name because I'm worried I'll butcher it on top. Yeah, Serge Nabry. Um, he was their leading goal scorer in 2020 uh, Euro Cup qualifying. Um, he plays for Bayern Munich. Um, he spent some time in England, but uh, failed to make the cut at uh, both West, at West Brom. Um, so he, he ended up in, in Bayern Munich. Uh, where he's been a great performer for them. And he's actually scored 15 times in just 20 appearances for Germany. That's so, amazing. Uh, he was with Arsenal, wasn't he, for a while? He was with Arsenal. And, uh, yeah, his time at West Brom that I mentioned was a failed loan spell. Um, wow. He, he seems to have uh, have got over that. Yeah, they should have held on to him a little uh, longer. I see uh, Leroy Sané and Ilke Gundogan there. Um, is Sane out on loan, or is he just not playing? He he is now at Bayern Munich, having moved from Manchester City, uh, kind of forced a way out. But yeah, teammate Ilkay Gundogan is coming off his best scoring season uh, for Manchester City. Yeah, sorry, I got to uh, brush up on my um, on my players there, but uh, he uh, yeah he was um, not popular with the coach, I think, at Man City. 
Yeah. Uh, let's go down to uh, the 2022 World Cup, so more recent scorers. Looks like LK Gundogan has moved from a defensive midfielder to an attacking midfielder. Is that right? Yeah, he's been given a lot more freedom, certainly at his club team by Pep Guardiola. Um, and, and it seems perhaps Germany is recognizing that as well. He uh, he scored two of their goals in quali uh, qualification for the 2022 World Cup um, and is their leading goal scorer uh, at this early stage. Yeah, so maybe they are rebuilding a bit because uh, Kai, uh, Kai Havertz and, and Serge Gnabry are pretty young. Mm -hmm. One interesting thing about the German team is that... Um, Thomas Müller and Mats Hummels are back in the team after being told in March 2019 by Joachim Löw uh, that they were no longer in his plans, um, but they have been recalled uh, for this tournament. Yeah, I was very surprised to see that. Um, uh, the fact that they had been out for so long and then the fact that they're coming back after that length of time, you kind of wonder what's going on there. Yeah, it really does. What uh, you wonder what's going on behind the scenes? Yeah. Uh, okay. Are we ready to move on to France? Yes. Let's uh, talk about Les Bleus, as okay. they are known, the Blues, France. Okay. All right. Well, we'll give an overview of their uh, tournament participation in both cups. Uh, they're a senior team, having entered all World Cups except in 1950 when they withdrew, and uh, they've been in every Euro Cup. They've uh, come in and out of prominence, but they're marked by three, maybe four strong periods. The first was around 1958, led by Juste Fontaine. The second was in the 1980s, led by Michel Platini. And the third, uh, at the turn of the millennium, which included kind of an afterflash in 2006, uh, was led by Zinedine Zidane. Zidane. Uh, recently, uh, we could call their uh, this period a fourth period of strength, although it's not necessarily associated with one strong personality. Agreed? Yes, I agree. Um, yeah. Perhaps a big personality, if there is one, would be uh, head coach Didier Deschamps, mm. um, who was a great player, of course, for France as well. All right. Yeah, well said. Uh, okay, let's uh, do a short version of their World Cup history then. France were there from the beginning of the World Cup, uh, but were not very strong. They were knocked out of the first round of the first two World Cups and only reached the quarterfinals, even though they hosted in 1938. Uh, their first strong period, around 1958, was actually the weakest of their uh, strong periods. And uh, they, they took third place in the 1958 World Cup. Uh, the second strong period saw them take fourth place in 1982 and third in 1986 uh, in those World Cups. Uh, while their third period, uh, their third period around the turn of the century saw them winning the cup as the host in 1998 and finishing with the swan song second place in 2006, uh, which followed a ghastly performance in 2002. Uh, they had a second World Cup win in 2008, which is the jewel of a fourth strong period. I guess we would have to uh, uh, consider it that, given their recent performances. Outside of these four periods, though, they only passed the group stage twice, uh, 1938 as host and in 2014, uh, while they failed to qualify five times. That was in 1962, twice in a row in 1970 and 74, and again twice in a row in 1990 and 94. Uh, that's close to the number of times they've fallen off at the group stage. So uh, five non-qualifications, uh, six group stage exits, and uh, seven times now uh, they've passed the group stage. So um, fairly even across the board there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll just recap France's uh, World Cup final victory in 2018. Um, they actually started uh, by negotiating a quite difficult qualifying group, uh, which included uh, Netherlands and Sweden. Um, they won the group four points ahead of both teams. Um, Sweden went through the playoffs and Netherlands were eliminated. 
Um, at the World Cup, France began with wins over Australia and Peru in the group stage and then a draw with Denmark. They then had quite a difficult route to the final through the knockout stage. Um, it began with a memorable 4-3 win over Argentina. Uh, they were down 2-1 just after half time, but then scored three goals in 11 minutes to take control um, and then held on after a slight scare um, with Argentina pulling a goal back in stoppage time. Uh, France then beat Uruguay 2-0 in the quarterfinals, then Belgium 1-0 in the semifinals, and then uh, Croatia 4-2 in the finals. Um, so they didn't rely on any penalties or uh, extra time. They were able to win all their knockout games outright um, and really were the dominant team um, in that World Cup. Yeah, I think the most memorable thing, though, was, uh, I mean, you're saying they didn't rely on penalty shootouts, um, I'm sure, but uh, they did kind of rely on a penalty in the final or actually a VAR decision for a penalty that was pretty controversial. Yeah, and that was a goal that uh, put them 2-1 up in the game. Um, and then after that penalty, they uh, they never really looked back after that. But I, I do remember, I don't remember the particular incident, but I do remember it being somewhat controversial. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, let's take a look at the Euro Cup history, which will be a bit longer and more detailed. Uh, there are four periods of strength are mirrored in the Euro Cup too, actually. Uh, they finished fourth in the first cup in uh, 1962, uh, which they hosted. And actually, that's a fairly poor result, uh, given that they were hosts. It basically means that they lost both games that they played. Uh, it took until 1984 and hosting again to reach the next cup. Uh, that was in the Platini years, and they won their first title in 1984, uh, winning as hosts. The semi-final there in 1984 is a classic game. Uh, they finished tied 1-1, one with one -one, tied 1-1 one -one with Portugal, but they won 3-2 in extra time, France scoring the coup de grace goal just one minute before going into penalties. Uh, in that competition, Platini scored nine of their 14 goals, uh, they had two weak cups after that, uh, two poor performances, uh, reaching only the group stage uh, in the second, and that uh, brought them into the Zinedine Zidane years. Uh, they reached the semifinals in 1996, and after winning the World Cup in 1998, they won their second Euro title in 2000. Uh, in a strange parallel to 1984, they beat Portugal in extra time of the semi-final again uh, just before it went to penalties. Uh, the goal in 1984 had been at 1.19, a minute before the end of extra time, and it was at 1.17 here. Uh, France also won an extra time against Italy in the final of the same tournament, uh, and that was when the golden goal uh, rule was in use. Uh, they had equalized in injury time in that final, Italy diving all over the place to waste time after their goal at 55. Uh, they earned only a draw in their first uh, against Romania in 2008, and uh, that year they finished bottom of the group. But their fourth strong period began with a second quarter final finish in 2012, uh, where they were knocked out by that, that very strong dynastic Spanish team. Uh, 2008 added to that with a second place finish. Uh, Portugal finally getting their revenge by winning in the final. And uh, true to the established pattern between the two teams, it was done in extra time. Uh, taking a look at their qualifying history in the Euro Cup, they hosted the first tournament, but they still had to qualify for it. Uh, they faced England in a preliminary round in 1964. They beat Bulgaria, who had narrowly knocked them out of the 1962 World Cup. But they fell in the final round to Hungary and uh, began a period of non-qualification that lasted until 1984. So uh, 20 years without a Euro Cup appearance. Uh, in 1968, they won a group stage but fell to Yugoslavia in a playoff round. Uh, they tied the first game there, but then lost 5-1 in the second leg away. 
1972 saw them finishing third behind Hungary and Bulgaria. And in the following cup, it was third behind Belgium and East Germany. Uh, the second place team in both of those cups also didn't qualify. So they were really far from reaching the, uh, the 72 and, seven, and 76 cups. They came close in 1980, though, and finally reached the cup as host in 1984. 1988, though, was a dreadful campaign with just one win over Iceland and four ties over eight of their games to finish a distant third behind USSR and East Germany. However, they won all games in 1992 for a convincing qualification, which ironically took place between two non-qualifications for the World Cup. Uh, they passed every qualification after uh, uh, after that, or from 1992 onwards. Uh, they went undefeated in 1996, but they did tie five of their ten games. Apart from 2004, where they won all games in an easy group, they dropped points in four of their games, uh, usually ten games, in all of the other tournaments from 2000 to 2012. Uh, they usually started with one of these, tying Iceland in 2000, uh, losing to Belarus in 2012, and often to weak teams like those above. Uh, Scotland beat them home and away in 2008, and Bosnia-Herzegovina, who they tied at home in 2012. In 2016, they didn't have to go through qualification because they were hosts, but they did a, a peculiar... A ghost qualification where they joined a, a group, but the games didn't count. Yeah, an interesting way of doing things to uh, to help prepare them for the tournament. Um, in the Euro 2016, um, they beat Romania, Albania, and tied Switzerland to top their group. So not not really the strongest group. Set 16, they fell behind to an early penalty against the Republic of Ireland. Um, but rallied in the second half to win 2-1. Um, a 5-2 win against Iceland followed uh, before they overcame Germany, 2-0 uh, in the semifinals, and they meet again here. Uh, France, as you mentioned, lost the final to Portugal in extra time, 1-0, which uh, really was a bit of an upset and kind of left left the host nation stunned. Um, this despite outshooting Portugal 18-9 in the game. Yeah, and uh, despite... Cristiano Ronaldo getting injured uh, 25 minutes in, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, overall then, France isn't as consistent as other top teams, at least in their qualifications and in their record of reaching cups. However, they tend to be more successful if they reach the tournament, with six top four finishes in their 11 World Cup appearances since 1958 and four top four finishes in their last nine Euro Cup uh, appearances. Uh, let's get into their recent history, and uh, maybe you can take us through that, Connor. Sure. So um, in very recent action, uh, France came uh, second in the 2018-19 UEFA Nations League A, uh, behind Netherlands but ahead of Germany, and they came first in the 2020-21 uh, League A edition ahead of Portugal, Croatia, and Sweden. Uh, they currently await the final uh, final four tournament to decide the overall champion, um, and that will be in October. Um, looking at the World Cup 2022 play... Um, oh, uh, sorry, I think I was supposed to do the uh, qualification for this tournament. Um, oh, right, sorry, I, I jumped right one. past it there. Yeah, no problem. Um Okay, well, this was actually a pretty good qualification. Uh, they did finish in first place. Uh, but again, a little, uh, a little lapse there against uh, Turkey, uh, who bested them, winning. Um, but they won all other games and didn't drop points to any weak team this time. So that was a bit more consistent. Okay, now take it away with uh, 2022. Yeah, that, that leads in nicely, actually. So... Um, yeah, in World Cup 2022 play, um, they demonstrated their inconsistency uh, with a home draw against Ukraine in their first game. As you mentioned, Kevin, um, sometimes having trouble right out of the gates in qualifying, as was the case here. Um, however, they, they improved that record with away wins in Kazakhstan 
and Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, so after three games, they have seven points and currently sit in first place. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it would be a surprise if they didn't make it to that cup. Uh, let's take a look at some of their scorers. And um, I'll just start out by saying, you know, Olivier Giroud has not really uh, uh, been a starter uh, for his club teams uh, uh, for quite a while. And yet he has remained the main man for France. Yeah, scoring six goals in qualifying. He was their leading goal scorer to get here. And, uh, of course, being a, a very crucial member of the team that won the uh, the 2018 World Cup. Yeah, I mean, he seems like, uh, or it seems like they should be uh, looking for another forward. I know they have Anton Griezmann, but uh, uh, are you a bit worried that they're not replacing him? Um, I... I'm more uh, surprised that he doesn't get more time for his club team. I think he's he's a good player. I think, um, you know, France seemed to have a system that works around him. They'll certainly have to uh, to think of replacing him soon. But France really has so much young talent uh, coming in. I don't think it'll be a major concern in the long term. Yeah, one of the players I like the most is uh, N'Golo Kante. I've heard, Connor, that uh, the ocean covers, uh, what, 72% of the Earth's surface? About that. Uh, yeah. They say N'Golo Kante covers the rest. <laughs> I would believe it. He, uh, he, he seems to be back at his best. He's, he, he covers so much of the pitch. Um, he gives France such a great um, base for, for them to build up their attack. Um, and in the recent Champions League final, Chelsea versus Man City, he was the man of the match. Um, so if he carries that form into France, he, he does the work of two or three players out there. He's such an asset to have on the pitch. Yeah, he's, he is an amazing player. Um, uh, and again, a part of uh, Leicester's uh, uh, season-winning title of the EPL. He, he was a main man there. Uh, let's take a look at the 2022 scorers. There are not many, but uh, do you want to take it away? Yeah, Antoine Griezmann and Usman Dambelli have the goals so far, just three of them. Um, so not real, really a surprise. Um, not on that list there is is 22-year-old striker Kylian Mbappe. Um, he scored 27 goals in 31 league appearances for PSG this year. Um, and was the leading goal scorer in in France's domestic league, um, and you know I would probably consider him to be their their main danger man going forward. He is, but uh, he he's not an out and out forward, is he? No, he usually plays on the wing. Um, with PSG, Neymar occupies that that centre forward role, but uh, he's so young and is coming off such a career year. Um, it's hard to see him not having an impact at this tournament. Uh huh. All right, well, we better get on with things and uh, go to uh, Portugal. Do you want to introduce them? Do they have a nickname they go by? They do have a nickname. Um, I don't think I can pronounce it, but it refers um, to the five shields um, or the dots inside them, which are on uh, the Portuguese uh, flag and crest. Um, it's the emblem in the middle of their flag there. Um, and that was used up until the 1970s as, as the the badge on their shirt. So that's no doubt where the name came from. Cool. Very interesting. I think I have heard them called the Sala Chow, but uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that properly. Uh, nevertheless, let's uh, get into their long history and uh, their tournament participation. So at times they feel like a top team in Europe uh, due to their early entry into the World Cup in 1934. And uh, in the Euro Cup, the first Euro Cup in 1960. And uh, they've had some big successes when they've qualified. However, the fact of reaching only two of the first 16 World Cups and one of the first uh, nine Euro Cups argues their position as a small team in Europe, historically speaking. Uh, additionally, they've also never won an Olympic medal in soccer. We haven't really talked about the Olympics uh, much in our histories. However, consistent qualifications and really good results in recent years, uh, uh, remaining much longer than expected, 
uh, suggests they are becoming a top team, perhaps, and they cemented this or made a strong argument in that favour, in that uh, direction by winning Euro 2016. Yeah, I would I would agree. They have been strong uh, for quite some time, and that that's reflected in their world rankings. As I said, they've been in in the top ten very very consistently over the past decade. Where where teams like France and more recently Germany have dropped out of that top ten, uh, Portugal have stayed there. Uh, yeah, I'm sure any young soccer fans would basically regard them, uh, you know, as as among the top teams, but. Uh, it's uh, kind of interesting that they haven't historically uh, been that way. We'll take a, a look at the World Cup history in short. Uh, well, and it is pretty short. They qualified for the World Cup only in 1966 and in 1986 uh, in the last century. But since 2002, they've qualified every time. Uh, they did leave their mark in 1966 with Eusebio, who scored a thunderous nine goals, helping them to third place as well as, uh, as well, he didn't help them finish fourth in 2006. I mean, uh, they finished third in 1966 and fourth in 2006. Oof, got, got a bit lost in myself there. Uh, there was much talk at the turn of the century about their golden generation, and that led to consistent qualification from 2002. But uh, it continued on well beyond uh, the actual players who were in that generation under the leadership of superstar Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, with this talent, they reached the round of 16 in 2010 and uh, 2018, and they finished fourth in 2006. Yeah, some really good uh, performances in recent World Cups. Um, 2014, um, in one of their former colonies, Brazil, um, was a bit of an exception when they failed to advance from the group stage, uh, finishing behind Germany and the United States. Um, in 2018, uh, they finished second in their group behind Spain, uh, whom they tied 3-3 court, uh, courtesy of a Cristiano Ronaldo hat trick. Um, and they finished ahead of Morocco and Iran. They were actually on course to win the group until conceding a 93rd minute penalty to Iran to tie that game 1-1, uh, which led to them finishing second in the group. Um, and it also meant they, they met Uruguay in the round of 16 um, and lost that game uh, for the tournament uh, to come to an end. Yeah, never a pleasant thing to, to meet Uruguay in the World Cup. Uh, let's take a, a look at the Euro Cup history in, in, in detail. Uh, Euro Cup actually does mirror their fortunes in the World Cup play. Uh, it took them a long time to reach their first cup, which they did in 1984, and they became consistent participants since 1996, actually uh, a bit earlier than World Cup participation, uh, where they, they reached it uh, in 2002 and participated consistently from that time. So a bit of a longer history in the uh, uh, 1996, uh, from 1996 onwards. They have the impressive record of passing the group stage every time they qualified. And uh, they did even be better than that in five of the eight qualifications. Uh, though there's no qualification in the 1960s to mirror their 1966 World Cup uh, success, uh, their 1984 success in the Euro Cup, where they reached the semifinals, uh, was followed by their second World Cup in 1986. In 1984, they went undefeated in the group stage, tying West Germany in their opener, but then they lost to host France in extra time of the next round, which was the semi-final in that 18 tournament. Uh, they didn't qualify for the next two cups after that, but a great run began in 1996. They were undefeated again in the group stage and again fell in the next round, the quarterfinals this time at the tournament had expanded to 16 teams with the uh, Czech Republic delivering the, the death blow there. Uh, they did better in 2000, winning all group stage games, impressively beating England and Germany, and they passed uh, Turkey in the quarterfinals before losing once again to France in extra time, just as they had in 1984. 
In 2004, they hosted the Euro Cup. Uh, usually the opening game features the host and the pot four team in the group, uh, which is designed to get the host off to a good start. However, Portugal was embarrassed by Greece. Uh, uh, they lost to Greece in their opener. They recovered, though, and they won every game after that, all the way to the final, where they met the unlikely Greece again, who beat them again to snatch the title. It was in this tournament that Cristiano Ronaldo emerged. Uh, 2002 would be the only time since 2000 where they didn't reach the semifinals. Uh, they passed the group stage here, but they lost to Germany in the quarterfinal. That's in 2008. Uh, they lost to the same team in the first game of 2012, but they recovered from their loss to Germany to pass the group stage, and they reached the semifinal where they were knocked out on penalties by Spain. 2016 saw them win in the most unconvincing manner. Uh, are you going to tell us about that one, Connor? Yeah, I'll get into that a little bit later on. Oh, okay. Uh, so maybe I'll skip talking about the 2016 Euro Cup and let you handle that one. And I'll go on to talk about their qualification. Is that moot? Nope, that's good. Carry on. Okay. Uh, in, in the Euro Cup qualification, they failed to reach the Cup until their seventh attempt in 1984. They beat East Germany twice in their first campaign in 1960 and beat Yugoslavia in the first game of round two. Uh, but then they were knocked out with a 5-1 loss in the second leg. They were competitive, but not really close in the following campaigns, coming second behind Bulgaria and then Belgium, and then took third place in the next two. So not really close there. And 1984 was their first successful campaign, and they finished first over USSR, an away loss to them being their only points drop. Uh, beating Poland, who were coming to the end of their strong uh, period, was promising. However, they failed in the next two campaigns, with uh, 1990 being a poor campaign, and 1992 uh, a little bit better. Sorry, I should say 1988 and 1992. Uh, in 1992, they won all at home, but they were poor on the road, and they finished behind Netherlands. From 1996, they qualified consistently, finishing fully six points ahead of Ireland and Austria that year. Despite a tie with Azerbaijan and being bested by group winners Romania, they still qualified directly in 2000. And after qualifying as host in 2004, they uh, qualified directly again in 2008, despite being bested by first place Poland and tying five of their 14 games. It was second place again in 2012, finishing behind Denmark and narrowly ahead of Norway. But this time they required a playoff win over Bosnia and Herzegovina, just as they had in World Cup. 2010 qualification, which uh, uh, two years prior. In 2016, uh, qualification started with a loss at home to Albania, and they, uh, they fired their manager after the first game. But that uh, ended up being to good effect as they went on to win all further games, and they finished a commanding first in the group. Uh, 2020 returned to their consistent pattern of dropping some points, but we'll take a closer look at that a bit later. Uh, let's go and uh, talk to you about their their recent uh, their recent performances. Yeah, a strong campaign in 2012 where they reached the semifinals gave Portugal something uh, to build on. In that tournament, they advanced out of the group of death, um, which they seem to be in here, um, behind Germany, um, but ahead of Denmark and the Netherlands. Um, in that tournament, they also gave eventual champion Spain arguably their toughest game, uh, taking uh, Spain all the way to penalties um, before Spain would go on to win. Um, in Euro six, uh, 2016, um, they had a very seemingly easy group, um, but they tied Iceland, Austria, and Hungary, tying all three games, um, and just barely managed to advance as a third-place finisher. 
They tied Hungary 3-3 um, in a game in which Hungary took the lead three different occasions, but uh, <laughs> could not hang on. Wow. And I think uh, Hungary won that group, didn't they? They did. They finished first. Yeah. Uh, in the knockout stages, uh, Portugal beat Croatia after extra time. Um, they actually scored just three minutes before the end of that game to tie it up. Um, they then beat Poland on penalties um, and then uh, defeated Cinderella team Wales in the semifinals. What was Ouch. really, yeah, that hurt. Uh, that was really their only convincing game of the cup. Um, they seemed doomed in the final against France when, when Cristiano Ronaldo was subbed out injured at 25 minutes. Um, but they managed to push through the game um, and take it to extra time, um, where an unlikely goal scorer, Adair, uh, struck in the 109th minute um, for the only goal of the game and to seal Portugal's first title. Yeah, I, and I don't think he's played for Portugal uh, much at all um, since then. Do you know? I don't think he, he's played much. and He's kind of fallen off the map a little but i'm not actually sure where he's playing these days i say thank god that ronaldo got injured because they sure needed his coaching from the sidelines <laughs> that uh final was also memorable for the moths um in that game oh yes yeah. <laughs> that's uh, right famous... i think one landed on his nose didn't it yes uh sobbing cristiano ronaldo had a moth on his nose and what was an enduring <laughs> one of the most enduring images from that uh, tournament <laughs> All right, well, let's just summarize uh, uh, Portugal here. So they had three good periods, and 1966 was a bit of a spike, uh, and it only took place in World Cup play, uh, really. The second uh, good period was around 1985, where they reached both the World and Euro Cups. And their third period, uh, many thought it would just be around the turn of the century, uh, but it, it's basically extended until now. And uh, it may be wrong to call it a period. Maybe they've become uh, a stronger team uh, in general. Um, the turn of the century team was captained by Luis Figo, uh, but now Christian, uh, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo basically holds the reins, of course. But with Ronaldo reaching retirement in the coming years, that's a question as to whether they will really maintain that top form. Yeah, Ronaldo, 36 this year, so likely playing in his last Euros. Very possible, yeah. Uh, let's go to recent performances. Um, uh, why don't you take it away there? I'll start with the, the Nations League. Um, they came first in the 2018-19 Nations League A, ahead of Italy and Poland, and then went on to beat Switzerland and then Netherlands in the finals um, to win the very first Nations League title. Uh, pretty mm. good achievement for them. Um, they finished second uh, in League A in the most recent version, uh, behind France, uh, but ahead of Croatia and Sweden. So so still a pretty good performance. Yeah, just one, uh, one loss to France. Uh, looks like a pretty good record there. Yeah, recent form, very strong. couple ties, um, but... Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of wins as well. So they they come in in good form, certainly better form than, than Germany, um, who were seeded. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of form, they didn't really start the 2020 uh, qualifying campaign very well. Uh, they tied Ukraine and Serbia both at home in their first two games. Uh, but they pulled themselves together and won all the rest of the games, except in uh, Ukraine where they lost. So actually, Ukraine finished uh, first in the group, uh, but Portugal uh, qualified directly, finishing second. And I guess that explains their pot three placement here. Yeah, some of those losses um, and the draws too, um, even though they qualified in second, they didn't have a particularly strong record. Five wins, two draws, and a loss. Um, so yes, that hurt them in the seeding for this tournament, absolutely. Yeah, well, let's take a look at how they're doing in the 2022 World Cup qualification. Yeah, um, an early win um, at home against Azerbaijan was followed by a tie uh, in Serbia, a team they tied in qualifying for this tournament, as you mentioned. 
Uh, most recently, it was a 3-1 win over Luxembourg. Um, so they stand first in that group, um, tied with Serbia, who has the same number of points. Um, even though uh, their wins were against weaker opposition, it's always good to build wins heading into a tournament. Yeah. Well, with Ireland looking uh, pretty weak this time around, that, that seems like a, a fairly easy group. Yeah, I agree. It's one they're, they're in control of now, and they, they should be able to stay there. All right, let's take a look at their scorers. Of course, on top is uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. But, uh, you know, he's not alone there. I feel the team has uh, has uh, improved around him over the the years. Obviously, Bruno Fernandes is um, a well-known name now. What do you say? Yeah, and some players not on that list. João Felix, uh, who plays for Atletico Madrid, and, and Diego Jota, uh, of Liverpool are also uh, kind of up and comers. Um, but Ronaldo, I mean, even at 36, he's still able to get it done. He, he scored 11 goals in qualifying, um, so half their total. So just a great record. Yeah, incredible. Uh, he really is a force of nature. Uh, let's take a look at the 2022 scorers. And there we see uh, Diogo Jota. He's their top scorer. Yeah, I think that coincided with his really good form uh, for Liverpool. He he had a few injuries towards the end of the season, um, but will but is in the lineup uh, for this tournament. Great. Okay. Well, we better get on with it, and uh, we're going to go to Hungary. Uh, do we have a nickname for them? Hungary are known as the Magical Magyars. Um, Magyar is the name of their their language um, and, and the the identity of the population. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have no, bears no similarity to Hungary, but Hungarian also bears no similarity to some of the languages, um, around it in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've heard it's, uh, Asian in origin and, uh, quite a, a mysterious grammar and syntax. Um, but don't quote me on that. Okay, let's get into the long history. I, I think I have heard them called the Magyars uh, quite often, though. Let's get into the long history with their tournament participation. So they uh, joined their first World Cup in 1934, miss, uh, missing, uh, not entering in 1930, and also missed in 1950 uh, because of the war. Uh, a lot of countries hadn't recovered fully from the war. Um, so uh, they were one of them. Uh, but they participated in, in every competition since. They were undisputedly the best in the world in the 1950s. In both 1938 and 1954, they were in the final, and they deserved to win at least one of those to justify uh, that reputation they had. They were uh, widely recognized as the best team in the early 50s. Uh, only England doubted that. So England invited them to Wembley in 1953 to prove that the uh, English were better at soccer. And Hungary handed them their first ever home loss, uh, winning 6-2 over the English. Furious, the English wanted a rematch. Uh, so they went to Hungary and lost 7-1. Can you imagine anything more English than that? <laughs> they should have known better. Uh, sadly, the 1956 revolution in their country slowly weakened them. Um, they did less well in cups from 1958. They stopped reaching cups uh, by 1986 and sadly fell to the bottom half of qualifying tables by the 1990s. But there is a glimmer of hope in this sto uh, story uh, because they've shown improvement in recent years. But knowing that history... Uh, we can understand why the fans were so upset in 2018 uh, when Andorra, uh, sorry, when Hungary lost to Andorra. Uh, this really must, must have touched a nerve in their country, uh, seeming to fall from the highest heights to the lowest lows. But in fact, uh, the, the lowest of their lows was probably 10 years earlier than that. Let's take a look at their uh, uh, history in the World Cup. We have to keep this one uh, kind of uh, at the summary level. Hungary was powerful enough in 1934 that Bulgaria just dropped out of qualification after heavy losses to them. 
uh, I think four one losses in both both home and away uh, matches. They only reached the quarter final that year, but uh, sorry, they being Hungary made the, the quarter final in. Uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong page here. Uh, the quarter final in 1934, <clears throat> but they made it to the final in 1938, where they lost to Italy. They reached the final in 1954 again and were fully expected to win over West Germany because they crushed them 8-3 in the group stage. Uh, but they were taken by surprise by the Germans and they lost their first game in six years, uh, an event which, which rattled the country so much that some people argue it led to the revolution against the Soviet Union in 1956. Uh, regardless, that began a slow decline they did reach the quarterfinals in 1962 and 66, but then they never passed the group stage after that. Uh, they were a bit unlucky not to reach the cup in 1970 and 74, uh, but they did in the following three cups. So roughly speaking, the group stage can define their level of strength in the 70s and 80s. But 1986 was the last time they reached the cup and the decline continued with third and then fourth place finishes in qualifying up to 2010. Uh, reaching a UEFA playoff in 1998 might seem like an exception, and I suppose it is, but uh, they lost there to Yugoslavia 7-1 at home and 5-0 in the uh, away leg, uh, which probably made them wish they had finished third or fourth that year. From 2006, though, they were getting more competitive in the campaigns, but they still seem quite a ways from reaching the World Cup. Yeah, mo most recently, um, 2014 wasn't actually a bad campaign. They finished third behind Netherlands and Romania, but ahead of Turkey that year. Um, they did suffer uh, an embarrassing 8-1 loss to the Netherlands, though. Um, it was, though, a very poor showing in 2018 qualification where they, where they lost fully half their games. Um, they failed to take even a point home or away against the top two, Portugal and Switzerland. Um, a draw in Faroe Islands uh, was looking like the low point before that 1-0 loss to Andorra, which you mentioned. Um, that was Andorra's first win in a qualifying campaign since 2004. Um, so really shows... Um, kind of what a what an achievement or lack thereof it was for Hungary uh, dropping that game. Oh, yeah, that was hell to pay with the fans there. I think they refunded the fans' money and gave them shirts and really had to, uh, had to try to make it up to them. Okay, well, we're going to go into a bit more detail uh, for the Euro Cup, so let's begin that. Uh, Hungary's best years had actually passed when Euro Cup competition started in 1960, uh, but that decline was slow, and something of their former greatness showed in uh, top four finishes in 1964 and 1972. In 1964, they qualified over France, and with no group stage, uh, they lost in extra time to Spain in the semi-finals. But they beat Denmark in extra time to take third place. In 1972, they won their qualifying group over Bulgaria and France, and then, after tying Romania twice in a final playoff, they went to a replay, which they won uh, to qualify. They lost both games of the four-team final tournament to USSR, and then they lost to Belgium to finish uh, in fourth place. From 1976, they failed to qualify for any cups, though they finished second in the qualifying group in the next two campaigns, a particularly tight one in 1982. Uh, fortunes declined further as they moved to third and then fourth place finishes, uh, bottom, bottoming out in 2008 to a sixth place finish, which we'll discuss in the next, uh, in the next section. But their form improved after that, and they reached the expanded tournament of Euro Cup uh, 2016, uh, not only reaching it, but passing the group stage undefeated, which included uh, a draw with eventual winner Portugal. We've covered a lot of that ground. Uh, they finished atop the group, actually, but they wished they hadn't when Belgium turned out to be their opponent in the round of 16. Uh, they lost their 4 nothing 
but uh, walked away probably feeling better about soccer than they had in the last 50 years. A close look at uh, qualifying paints a picture of that slow decline. Uh, four years after the Soviets had crushed the rebellion of 1956 uh, with tanks in the streets of Budapest, they were knocked out of the first uh, Euro Cup in 1960 by the USSR. It must have been psychologically painful, but uh, they would be faced with that several times over the next few years. They successfully passed three rounds of qualification in 1964, but the format went to a group stage in 1968, which they won over East Germany, Netherlands, and Denmark. Unfortunately, that led them to a playoff against USSR. They won the home leg there, but that probably only made it more painful uh, when they lost the away leg by a larger margin. In 1972, they won the group and the subsequent playoff over Romania, but that would be their last successful qualification for the Euro Cup. They finished second in the following two campaigns and sunk to fourth after that, finishing behind Greece in 1984. Uh, fourth place would become their permanent finishing spot until 2008, except for third place in a tight campaign uh, uh, sorry, the uh, third place in a tight campaign in 1988. Uh, in 1992, they lost at home to group winners USSR, and uh, tying them away didn't prevent them from finishing fourth again. In 1996, they were undefeated at home, but losing all games on the road meant finishing fourth again. A tie with Liechtenstein added to the insult of fourth place in 2000, and surprise upstarts Latvia condemned them in 2004 to yet another fourth place finish. But the bottom really came in 2008 when they finished sixth in a group of seven, which could hardly get any worse. And fortunately it didn't. In 2012 they finished third, including a win over Sweden. And in 2016 they finished third again. This one coming with the bonus of, uh, of it being an advancing position for the 2016 Euro Cup, which was now expanded, uh, allowing them entry. Uh, they beat Nor Norway in a playoff to reach the Cup, and they performed well once there. Uh, 2020 was another fourth place finish, but the back door of the Nations Cup was available for entry into the competition. And I hope I'm not stealing your lines here. Uh, they did well taking advantage of that Nations Cup opportunity. Maybe you can fill that out for us. Yeah, um, they didn't qualify directly, but they, they did make it to a four-team playoff. Um, there they won uh, their first game 3-1 uh, in, uh, in Bulgaria to advance to the final. And uh, in the final, they met uh, the darlings of the 2016 Euros, uh, Iceland, um, and beat Iceland 2-1 uh, to make it back-to-back -back, uh, successful qualifications. Yeah, uh, super. Great. Uh, okay, do you want to say anything more about the Euro, uh, uh, the recent Euro Cups, or should we move on? Let's move on. I think we've, we've covered it under Portugal and uh, some of the other teams. Okay, great. So, uh, in summary, Hungary's long fall from the very top in the early 50s hit bottom with a sixth-place finish in their Euro 2008 qualifying group. Uh, however, as we've said, they are uh, moving upwards in the direction of a resurgence. Uh, however, it is the expansion of the Euro Cup that has given them their first uh, entry into the tournament since 1986. And even in this 2012 campaign, they're really uh, only there because of the expansion. And the worry is that their, their qualification campaigns haven't really uh, improved enough to to say that they've, they've come back to uh, cup form. Yeah, um, I think you summed it up perfectly there. Um, they they really would not have qualified in Euro 2016 or this tournament had it not expanded from 16 to 24 teams. 
Yeah, and that actually leads us into the uh, recent history, and maybe I'll just cover uh, the Euro Cup qualifying uh, first there, Connor. since um, yeah. we're talking about that. You can see it's uh, not a great campaign. They finished in fourth place, uh, although it is just uh, two points out of second place. Uh, Wales finished second and Slovakia finished third. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm all wrong there. Croatia was on top. Wales finished second, Slovakia third, Hungary fourth. And uh, they did manage to beat uh, Croatia at home. And uh, they also beat second place Wales at home. Um, but uh, their road record was uh, a little bit poor. And you took us through that uh, Nations League playoff, which actually has nothing to do with the qualifying campaign. It's rather a backdoor. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, they, they, well, qualifying hasn't improved. They have done well in uh, Nations League. Um, in the inaugural edition, they finished uh, second in League C behind Finland, but the top two were promoted, so they advanced to League B. Uh, there they finished first uh, over Russia, Serbia, and Turkey, so they won promotion again, now into League A, among uh, where they'll play Europe's elite. Um, wow. Looking at World Cup 2022 play, um, they tied Poland 3-3 uh, three, three at home um, and then beat uh, San Marino and Andorra away. Um, they stand second in the group behind England, but their two victories coming among two of the weakest teams uh, in, in UEFA qualifying. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm sure Andorra was a bit of a psychological barrier. Yeah, you still need to win those. It's, it's not automatic as they, they learn to their peril. Yeah, and Andorra's getting better. I don't think they can be taken for granted as much as uh, they used to be. Uh, going back to the recent matches, do you know if any other team uh, jumped up two groups like that? That's pretty impressive. I believe they're the only ones that have, have won promotion in their two uh, Nations League uh, tournaments. Yeah, not to put you on the spot there, but I, I don't think I remember uh, seeing that. Uh, let's take a look at their scorers in 2020. And um, I'll let you lead that. Yeah, Willie Orban was their top scorer in qualifying for this tournament uh, with three goals. He's actually a center back uh, who plays for uh, RB Leipzig. So it might show pointer or expose some of their weakness at the top end of the field. Um, Adam uh, Salai, he's only scored one in qualifying. Um, he's probably the man they'll look to. Um, he scored 23 goals in 70 appearances for Hungary, which is actually better a better goals per game ratio than than his club form. Um, he's a six foot four center forward uh, who plays for Mainz in Germany. Yeah, I think I remember him from the last cup. Uh, two red cards there in the qualifying. That uh, that doesn't read that well. No, that's something they'll. Uh, uh, they'll have to watch. Um, they're in a difficult group as it is. Trying to play against one of the other teams in their group with 10 men um, would surely uh, oh. condemn them to defeat. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure Ronaldo will be provoking them. No red cards in 2022, but a whole lot of goals there. Uh, some of the same names. Yeah, they do have goal scoring spread out. I think we have to keep in mind, though, that their goals came from – the majority of their goals came from games um, – against San Marino and Andorra. So um, vastly different level of competition than they'll face here. Very true. Yeah, well said. Yeah, if they have trouble scoring, uh, that might be their downfall in the Euro Cup. And I guess that kind of leads us into uh, part three of the um, podcast here. It's, a, it's another long one. But uh, let's just have a quick chat about uh, the group. What do you say? Well, I'll start with Hungary, and I, um, as magical as their their uh, their run was in 2016, topping the group, I don't see a repeat of that here. Um, their records in, in Nations League play has been good, but they haven't been tested against top teams, and their qualification record, again, wasn't good enough to get them here automatically. They relied on the back door. Um, I think they'll be in very tough. Um, I think if they got a point, that would have to be uh, celebrated. Um, by their 
yeah, I have to agree with you there. There, there is a bit of fragility in Germany and uh, Portugal that they might possibly take advantage of. But uh, I think even one point would be uh, would be more than they can expect. To be honest. Mm -hmm. So that takes us to the top three: Germany, France, and Portugal. Um, Germany are the seeded team, but are actually ranked lower. Um, in FIFA and ELO than both France and Portugal, who are last year's finalists. Do you see Germany as being possibly the odd team out here, or how do you see this going? I mean, there are some factors that, that uh, kind of lead in that direction. Uh, they're coming in on the back of a few uh, shocks, really, so that might affect their confidence. Uh, picking up players who have been off the team for a couple of years now, uh, that doesn't look like a good sign to me. And there's something I don't like about the announcer, uh, sorry, the manager kind of announcing that he's going to be done after the cup. That seems a bit demotivating to me. How about you for Germany? Yeah, like we said, there, there's question marks over Germany, which, which very rarely is the case. Um, I, I think this is the wrong time in their history to be placed in a really competitive group. Um, most of the times, I don't think they'd really bat an eye at it. Um, but possibly doing a little bit of a, a rebuild, um, there is a chance that their weakness could be exposed by two really good teams. Um, it's hard to imagine Germany not passing, but it does seem doesn't really seem that their chances are much better than France or Portugal. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really looking at details here because these are, you know, three teams that you would be surprised uh, didn't pass. But in a way, one of them has got to go or, or, or um, basically if, if Hungary gets no points, there's a chance all three of them will pass. But we're kind of tasked with, uh, with picking one out of the three uh, to not pass, which is very difficult to do. Yeah, France are in such a such a good period right now. They they've been inconsistent in tournaments. Uh, they've won World Cups and gone out in the group stage the next time. Um, but there's uh, they have such a deep team um, coming in on on such a dominant World Cup performance. I really don't. I really see France going through and probably are my favorites to win the group. Um, it's really going to come down to the games between them though and. Um, Portugal and Germany, it may be a case, um, not to take anything away from Portugal, but does does Cristiano Ronaldo decide that game, or or is a team like Germany able to reduce his influence and, and thereby give themselves a better chance of winning? I mean, if anyone can uh, shut Ronaldo down, it's, uh, it's teams like this. Um, and I agree, actually, it's really through the course of this, uh, of doing this recording here that I've, I've come to feel... France uh, is the favourite. Uh, I kind of came in really being unable to separate them. Um, it's just there are a couple of little points to uh, pick on with, with Germany and Portugal, uh, but there don't seem to be any negative points uh, for France. What do you think? Do you see anything that could be a weakness there? I don't really see a weakness. What's, what's hampered France in the past has been disunity. Um, and kind of coaches that haven't had the, the confidence of the team. But they seem to have that now. They seem to be united. They seem to be ticking over well under Didier Deschamps. So I I don't really uh, see a weakness, and, and you, you phrased it well. Um, you know, maybe some questions over Germany or Portugal. Not many, but France just seems so solid at the moment. Yeah. Uh, for Portugal, again, not a lot to pick on, uh, but you have mentioned uh, concern over... Ronaldo's age, thirty-six, is 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 pretty uh, old for for a, a player, and you wonder, especially if they go far in the tournament, um, will he be able to sustain uh, playing the way he has? Yeah, he's done. He's done it for so long, um, but obviously had an injury at the last tournament. Um, and he, he was on a Juventus team that kind of underachieved in, in Italy. So he, it wasn't the best uh, uh, year of his career. Obviously still very, very strong. Um, 
but Portugal also have some good players coming through. Um, there could be some draws. It could be teams, um, you know, take all these teams could take points off each other on any given day. Um, so it's going to probably come down to uh, their head to head games. Really hard to pick winners. Um, but if I had to separate them, which you tend to make me do, I'm going to say France first, uh, Germany second, Portugal third, and Hungary last. Do you agree? Well, you, you kind of uh, stole my line there, but I was going to add with Portugal uh, just one more thing. Like they had a, a, you know, they kind of staggered through that campaign in 2016. You, you said the only... Uh, kind of convincing performance was against Wales. Um, that was just one of their seven games. They tied uh, all three group stage games there. Uh, and uh, I, I was unconvinced by them in 2016. So um, I'm not sure... I'm not sure they've changed that much since then. The other thing I was thinking about was uh, if uh, they're, they're a team that often takes games to extra time and penalties, and uh, I wonder with Ronaldo at 36 uh, whether whether he could really handle, um, you, you know, reaching uh, uh, or playing that many minutes. But uh, yeah. if you're going to put me to the test here, uh, I got to say France uh, on top. And, um, yeah, Germany's consistency uh, wins out for me over Portugal. But, uh, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised to see it uh, finish any way. And I kind of uh, have a little hope that Hungary uh, will play a, a role by maybe stealing a tie off one of these teams and uh, them being the deciding factor. Yeah, that would make it inter interesting. Um, so we are in agreement, but like you, if the top three, they could finish in any order, and it really wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, well, this is going to be uh, just a fabulous group to watch, but I think um, that's it for me for this podcast. How about you, Connor? Yeah, nothing else to add for me. Um, can't wait for the tournament to get started. We'll have to wait the longest for Group F to get started, but once it does, it should be fabulous. There'll be great games every match day. Yeah, definitely. That's going to be uh, the best group to watch, I think. Okay, well, uh, have a great uh, evening, Connor, and thanks very much for uh, joining here. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to work on this podcast with you. Uh, thanks for everything, Kevin, and we'll see you at the tournament. You bet. Okay, take care, Connor.